The Life After Commencement documentary is legally protected by copyright. All perfectly different consulting related information distributed is considered as sensitive material. Non-disclosure, non-use, and non-compete obligations are for three years from the effective date of communication or viewing. All right, so we're just logging in here. We probably got about like, hmm, I'd say about 10 minutes. So we're about 10 minutes early. All right, so my pen and my notebook. So almost started. So before we get started with the program, we want to share some tips about using this webcast interface. Life after commencement, bringing job skills and HR competencies to life, part one. When I was in my first evaluation, I had access to everything. I had pretty much like the privileged lifestyle of the working workforce or the job hunt. It was a privileged job hunt. But this time, I'm in a position where my job hunt isn't as privileged. I don't have transportation and I don't have much access to what the workforce has to offer. So, I want to do an evaluation based upon that. I needed a job. I had a lot to learn, and I was more than willing to dedicate the time. I'm getting ready to go out on my uh, bus ride to uh, look for some jobs. Looks like I got just about maybe, I'd say about maybe two miles to go, two to three miles. While sitting on the bus, I encountered some of the most lively and interesting people from all walks of life. I couldn't help but wonder about their story, you know? Like what stage were they in in life? What was their adversity? And what did they do in order to overcome it? And just like that, I was on my way back home to go back to the drawing board. Life after commencement, bringing job skills and HR competencies to life, part two. So I decided to take myself through that of a simulated experience of someone who did not have adequate or permanent housing, if you will. And little did I know that I was in for a ride. In celebration of the Thanksgiving spirit, I just wanted to say a couple of things that I am thankful for. I am now thankful for a car. I'm thankful for a computer. I am now thankful for the goodness. Oh my gosh, it's cold season, so I now have the ability to afford insurance, so I'm thankful for that. I did private insurance. And I'm thankful for strength. Want to see what it's like to be on a job hunt on the go? Okay, so I'm headed back from the career fair and it was such an amazing turnout. Then on top of that, I think I gave away probably about maybe 20 resumes all together. And what I like most about it is the fact that everyone was so positive. So what I'll do is definitely now, gonna go and make those applications, apply, apply, apply. Um, and then also make my calls. All right, so see you later. So out of all the jobs, I'm gonna go ahead and 
sift through all of these papers that I've gotten that are going to help me in finding a, in, in applying for a job. Make sure we got everything. All right. That's 13. That's 14. 24. And that's 25 resumes that I will have to fill out. Hi everyone. What today's evaluation is going to be is based upon health care and health insurance. Okay, so we're walking and we're headed on into the health department and we're just doing this to get a general idea of what they can give versus what paid insurance gives. Okay, so I've just gotten all the information that I need and now I'm in the waiting room waiting to do the test. The one thing that I'm seeing is that it doesn't really cover what health insurance doesn't cover. So it's almost like you just got to get health insurance either way. And then on the way here, I had a horrible flat tire. So Can I try? Yep. Okay. I have to admit that I was very happy with the way that the day had occurred. Um, because of the fact that my study had evolved from this concept of effectuation, of which means the self-learning concept, to this guided concept of training as well. So I went from training myself, of course, on several tasks, to also, of course, learning how to change the tire, of which was guided from others. And I wondered how this aspect would work. Um, with both effectuation and oh, guidance, it's a good life interchangeable. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that, that is a practical skill. Yeah. A lot of people don't know. I'm sorry? I think, yes, it's the passenger front tire, the one that uh, has the spare on it. So doing a lunch run and taking lunch orders. We have our list. Okay, so a public sub and that's with lettuce, tomato, onion, mayo, and honey mustard. Ah, I remember it. Okay. I devised a plan. I talked to legislators and went shopping to prepare for the next step of my journey. I had even took a detour to go meditate to mentally prepare myself for the next step. So, here we go. It seemed as though the real work was just beginning. On assignment off days, I began planning on how to write a program that would advocate for those in the same position. Life after commencement, bringing job skills and HR competencies to life, part three. The small business development portion gave me a wide range of experience from corporate filing to um, financials that were in regard to taxes as well as uh, business dwelling expenses. I, I can truly say that I learned a lot during that portion of the study. What I've done is I've calculated all of my money through a self-employment calculator. After doing that, I've added everything else that I needed to pay to the IRS. Back. And what we are doing today is doing a mock trial run by doing the TurboTax self-employed. Um, another thing is also making sure that our marketing material goes out. So the good thing that we've seen is that I've gotten my material camp. But this is what we like to call within legislation of, to me, a bill card. And what you would do is you would write these out and you would send them to whoever you want your bill to be voted upon. So that's what typically goes on when it comes time for like voting on house bills and stuff. I don't necessarily have a particular house bill that I want to vote for yet. I'm just going based off of causes that will happen later.
But what's happening is I know that I've gotten mine, so that means that all of them have gotten theirs. So we've sent them to all of the places that they need to go, so that's one assignment that's been complete. So all right, so based upon the picture that was shown yesterday, we did an update of the Perfectly Different Consulting in 2017. That post within itself yesterday, or within like the past few days, I had it up for like two or three days. That one got, I believe, 317 views or something like that. For the one for today, and metrics are definitely increasing. The international campaign is entirely done, including the national campaign. So it looked like the entire plan was in development. After reaching out to expand the company network internationally, I believe that all things were coming together. The next step was landing the internship and completing graduate school work assignments in the hopes of one day writing a grant. Throughout the process of my development, I continued with my internship practicum for graduate school. This required that I continue with an internship with a congressional office to get a general overview of the legislative point of view of some of the things that I were doing. In addition to that, I'd taken some time off to celebrate my birthday. I'd also, after celebrating my birthday, I went back into some more community service to kind of get a general idea also of what the public needed and what the needs of the community were. After taking that much needed hiatus, I was right back to looking up my resume, doing some job analysis, applying for jobs within the state and also other states, fixing my dissertation, applying for grants, and also continuing my studies for the SHRM certification. This was the day that I'd run completely out of funds to have the ability to afford even going to the internship, to acquire work experience, to have the ability to remain competitive in the industry. But with all of these challenges that were behind me and all of this data that was being collected, I found a sense of solace and happiness in it, knowing that I was making progress. The next objective was to continue the research at the legislative office or the congressional office to make sure that I could create this merger between my objectives and also governmental policy. This project truly gave me just the confidence I needed to grow in my skills development phase for the workforce. I found myself setting goals that included the flat world concept of international communications and support. After gaining these skills, I reflected while in the experience. Life after commencement can be a very overwhelming time for a young adult. In fact, after graduation, a majority of young adults leave a life surrounded by more than 5,000 peers to transition either back home with their parents or to a quiet life on their own. In addition, the daily job hunt requires knowledge and a demonstration of a variety of skills. We resiliently participate in job fairs, prepare resumes, write cover letters, take job tests, and go on interviews with no income. On average, one could submit up to 50 resumes a day just to receive one interview. As we experience days of rejection letters, delayed responses, job probationary trials, and more, how do we make sense of it all? I wanted to find a way to show both employed and unemployed graduates that they are not alone. So I invited them into my own method of personal development. You know, during my interview and resume submission process, over time I developed a record-keeping aspect. Pictures. I would take photos of all the experiences and opportunities that my job hunt provided. I also recorded some of my experiences, both the good and bad, to get an outside view or perspective. The collective homemade videos and photos added a distinct value to my life. Not only did I recognize how much I had grown, my job hunt allowed me to find myself through the essence of self-discovery. Hello, my
My name is Rodney Shea Ingram, and I am a student of Argosy University, Sarasota, within the College of Business. I am defending for a Doctor of Education in Organizational Leadership, and my study is upon the existence of human resource recruitment, skills training, and professional development trends within a social media platform. Substantial research has been undertaken with the field of social media research. I work to bridge the communicator and national community and remain unbiased in this field. This research allows me to discover the specific issues that give rise to innovation, industry, trade, human resource development, and long-term long-term community goals within an international human resource research platform. The subject is carefully investigated by conducting qualitative analysis from the international participants and researchers which have been trained or previously studied. Drawing from the evidence from the qualitative survey conducted by me and the National Human Resources Division of Career Training and Professional Development Partners within this research, its findings were recently posted in Sherman Law Commerce in the University of Nevada. A theoretical framework designed for students are also presented. In addition to research assessment of human resource recruitment, skills training, this dissertation defends the Bridging the Gap Theory that I hold, conceptualizing the human resource process as a process of deep literature review, the research methodology, the data collected, the analysis process, including the findings and results, the science, conclusion, implementation, and recommendation. Following will involve an overview of the conceptualization process and purpose of the study. According to CareerSource and MFA, nearly 100% of human resources is recruited by students. To this, the introduction begins by introducing the concept of international relations and society. Considering the definition, this dissertation outlines the human resource problem and the gap in investigation. From the research assumption, human resource development, skills training, professional development initiatives within the international human resource community. The emergence of the 21st century has been strongly influenced by the forces of globalization and technological development. It has been so strongly influenced that the educational and training fields have begun to heavily depend upon global and technological initiatives. This study in its entirety is based upon the existence of human resource recruitment, skills training, and professional development trends within a social media platform. Social media platforms have become the driving influence of recruitment, skills training, and professional development initiatives of the human resource management field. Considering this, researchers have focused their studies upon e-learner-centered approaches, upon blogs, MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, and other social media platforms. Chapter 1 describes the SHRM initiative of 84% of organizations to support the current social media platforms for recruitment. Additionally, 9% of the organizations mentioned in the SHRM research study plan to use the platform for personal recruitment. Within this section, I found that the state of current investigation is highly applied in elaboration of international recruitment, skills training, and development research platforms. So this study's purpose was to investigate the existence of human resource concepts within a contemporary online social networking environment. In dedication to contemporary human resources, this qualitative study offers perspectives of the vendors that provide human resource management services. This study questions the nature of international business, the demographics, and the popular themes within the field of social media development, skills training, and professional development. Within the problem background, the dissertation identifies the research problem as the lack of inquiry upon the nature of international human resource leaders and social media platforms. Human resource material has become widely popularized within social media, right? The problem background presents the demographic capacity of human HR recruitment and development agencies and how they're not specifically known concerning their recruitment, skills training, and professional development preferences. So previous studies and experiences and interactions 
data from researchers, staffing agencies, private interests, government organizations deal with a significant problem within the field of skills training and professional development. Within this training, researchers, government agencies, and staffing agencies elaborated upon current workforce development trends, recruitment trends, and a general need of the international community. Additionally, the collected data revealed current statistics related to skilled labor. For example, in 2014, the South African government believed that the number of skilled workers had increased from 1.8 to 3.8 million since 1994. Now, as students complain of a lack of preparation and job availability in Andorra, the Camp Up Job Center of Cambodia adds that there's a lack of college transition preparation, workforce network, and job interview training. Similar opinions and initiatives were also stated in this comment from Bangladesh, Algeria, Upon the concept of recruitment, Chapter 1 also indicates the expectation and social media content, as well as general recruitment trends of American staffing agencies that include Breadcrumb, Randstad, and Apple Inc. staffing agencies. Although prior pilot studies have determined the need for human resource recruitment, skills training, and professional development in the United States, there remains a lack of investigation upon the international community as it pertains to sharing our problems. As human resource material is widely popularized on social media, the research presents that the issue was also present within the idea that the international demographic capacity of current human resource recruitment and development are not completed yet during the active use of social media platforms. The phenomenon of interest has been acknowledged as a qualitative research study that analyzed the international demographic capacity of current HR recruitment and development the intent of this research is to evaluate the need on a social network that defines interest. As the research location's function is to provide social networking opportunities for people to share similar or diverse personal or career interests, the needs of this research examines research location agencies' goal to establish interconnected online communities to find international human resource professionals. With respect to the problem background of this study, the purpose of this study is to uncover data regarding the international demographic capacity of human resource recruitment and development in the social media platform of research location agencies with dual citizenship and work. So let's take this upon a perspective of skills training and professional development. Anna Brown, writer for Pew Research, counts that in 2015, there was a slightly decrease in interest in the number of American workers that required average or above average workforce preparatory and education experience and jobs. Braun further reports that 54% of the American labor force indicated the significance of skills training and development from the need for knowledge and capability in correlation with advancement of the work that was created. This dissertation and specification identifies the research problem as a lack of investigation upon the nature of recruitment, human resource skills training, and professional development initiatives within international HR social media platforms. An example, the Society for Human Resource Management reports that 84% of organizations report the current use of social media platforms for the purpose of recruitment, and 9% report plans of using social media for recruitment. An example, U.S. White House officials and other government officials have worked tirelessly to develop plans to not only create new jobs, but also to support the STEM technological initiative. In correlation with government initiatives, on October 4th, Ed Peachy, president and CEO of CareerSource Tampa Bay, presented a quarterly activity report before the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners. It presented a solution to an unemployment rate trend of 4.3 in similarity to the STEM development initiatives. However, it is also recognized that this skills gap extends beyond the Tampa Bay region. Researchers Robertson and Aquino have indicated that this may be a national issue. The skills gap, it requires individuals to increasingly embrace lifelong learning to remain competitive in a national economy. In support of this idea, this is why we have the U.S. House Committee on Education and the Workforce to elaborate upon these initiatives. And even the U.S. House Committee on Foreign Affairs and the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations 
extend this issue beyond national concerns. This study's objective is to investigate the existence of these recruitment, training, and developmental constructs within a contemporary human resource-related social media platform. This study is qualitative in nature, and it will analyze the international demographic capacity of current HR recruitment and development practices within a U.S.-based social media web service platform. This project's goal is designed to provide scholarly knowledge regarding the significance of human resource trends presented within the selected social media platform. This goal can be achieved through theoretical evaluation based upon the context of web platform metrics relative to participant data regarding leadership and navigation, ethical practice, business acumen, relationship management, consultation, global and cultural effectiveness, and communication. In addition, the intent of this research project is to also suggest the nature of these developmental findings can shape an understanding of the field of global human resource advancement. The output of this study is a source material that educational administrators and human resource leaders can embolden the existence of human resource development fundamentals most significant to the subject of global and cultural effectiveness. So let's dive into the content of the theoretical framework. All right, so now let's get into the theoretical framework, which is the review of literature. We're going to start out with leadership and navigation. So throughout the course of this study, what we did was we had defined the leadership and navigational concept. And then we also found results from the study from Beckman, Devos, and Valkier. Um, and which is a study that was based upon the correlation between educational administrator leadership styles and the development of new human resource practices for on instructor onboarding. And I kind of correlated this also with human resources as onboarding is a human resource concept. And the results revealed that um, both instructional and transformational leadership styles were directly associated with educational administrator based job descriptions and organizational change objectives. So what this found was that leadership style was very important to the area of leadership and navigation. Now, what we also found is a study that measured the correlation between career development needs. And um, this research kind of really found that um, human resource practices were an effective way to increase loyalty commitment to organization and improve organizational performance by focusing upon employee career needs. And this was a study based out of Germany. Now, also, there was a study based out of Malaysia. And this study sought to examine the correlation between motivation enhancing practices on turnover intentions and talent engagement amongst the managers of, of a local hotel industry within Malaysia. So the results indicated that certain motivation enhancing practices, such as employee recognition, salary bonuses, and so forth, had a significant negative relationship with the turnover intention of the employees. So what we found was um, within this Malaysia study, or what I found within the Malaysia study, was that um, the, the study of, of motivation and how a leader can motivate its employees is very important within the subject of leadership and navigation as well. It teaches you the motivation is practically the concept or the outcome that you're looking for with your employees um, while you're trying to practice leader and navigation within an organization. Also, a 2017 study based out of, of the United States by Hayati Atafi and Ahirni, they directed an exploration upon a social network perspective of Salesforce leadership and motivation during strategy implementation. So this one was kind of different and kind of the leadership when in use upon business acumen and or when actually doing the job. And the results revealed that salespeople with high network centrality or low center, or strategy commitment, they lower their peers' commitment and hurt the effectiveness of a transformational manager. So the research also reported that sales managers' use of transactional leadership can decrease the non-committed central salesperson's influence over peers. So what we see here is that the use of leadership, again, is also very important upon um, the subject of motivation and motivating employees, and even in, in this case, motivating managers. In 2016, uh, Sunny Giles of the American-based 
Harvard Business Review conducted a study that collected data from a participant sample of 195 leaders in 15 countries and 30 global organizations. So this was a big study. And the study requested that participants select the 15 most significant leadership competencies from a list of 74. Of the participant sample, 38% of the survey respondents regarded leadership guidance as a motivator and also a highly rated attribute. Now getting into the concept of ethical practice, we also found a number of studies and the, those studies were also based out of different countries as well. And what we found was Gustafsson, he kind of um, explained the nature of how philosophical culture kind of developed within the area of ethics and uh, even upon the area of utilitarian rights, justice, common good, and virtue-based ethics, of which are all used um, across um, several ethical guidelines um, in addition to that within the workplace, um, just based upon moral reasoning. We also define the subject of ethics as well and ethical leadership as well. So the Giles study that we spoke about earlier, it also mentioned that 67% of the survey respondents, they mentioned ethical and moral standards um, to include transparency and honesty. And it was also a highly rated leadership preference. So we see here that it is very, very important. And also um, Scott, based upon the United States, in addition to the Giles study that was based out of the United States, um, it said that practitioners face decisions involving ethics on a regular basis. So this is something that um, includes, you know, discerning what is right, of course, and transparency, and also human rights and avoiding conflicts of interest. So it just goes in to define it. But then we get into a gyronet study that was also um, kind of actually based upon the United Nations. And it indicates that ethical leaders, they not only evaluate ethical practice, but they also seek to inspire peers. So this also goes with what they're what leaders are saying and, and how um, leaders are supposed to conduct themselves ethically. So the study um, that we see that's based out of China, it evaluated the, which is a Wu Kuan Yim, Chao, and He. It evaluated the relationship between CEO ethical leadership and corporate social responsibility. The study focused upon the mediating role of organizational ethical culture and the moderating role of managerial discretion upon issues such as corporate governance, um, corporate compliance, and so forth, and also employee motivation. So the results indicated that ethical leadership positively influences corporate social responsibility through the practice of organizational and ethical culture. Also a study based out of Germany again. Um, it also suggested that there was a lack of empirical evidence upon whether ethical behavior um, or, eth or of the ethical lead uh, or the, of the organizational leaders affect organizational attractiveness. So this is just saying, you know, whether an, a leader um, makes an organization attractive by displaying this type of leadership. So the study investigated this and in turn the results indicated that strong ethical leadership behavior does um, indicate or influence an increase in higher ethical ratings. There's also a study that was based out of Africa that kind of explained that there's there's an importance here also and what we're seeing is that across um, several guidelines in several countries there there is a, a need for a, an interest in ethics. Um, as in Africa, it is saying that there is an, a strong pluralism in Africa, and scholars mention that because of this worldview, that it kind of it curbs holistic um, practices and business activity. So it declares that these strengths and weaknesses and the sources of morality um, have yet to be worked on, which of course it shows that in some countries, there shows that um, some have kind of got it down and it shows that in some um, there may be a need or just based upon this study in some organizations um, there may be somewhat of a need. Now getting into critical evaluation. What we're seeing is that the um, Society of Human Resource Management, we're, we take their definition of um, defining this concept. Um, so what we found is a study based out of the United States uh, from Greer, Carr, and Hip in 2016. They conducted a critical evaluation upon strategic staffing and business and small business performance. The researchers suggested that, that there's been little attention to the strategic aspects of staffing. Um, also, um, this inquiry influenced the study upon relationships between strategic approaches to staffing and then the small perform firm performance using survey data from 139 founders and owners of small firms. So 
the results kind of indicated that recruiting approaches that imitated the best practices and processes um, of larger businesses were positively related to perceptual um, measure of firm performance. Also, the research indicated that the growth-oriented selection processes were also um, positively related to firm performance. So now another study um, is also mentioning um, that researchers have um, been reviewing these development and evaluations um, also. And it also mentions that the level of critical evaluation applied when conducting performance appraisals is based upon qualitative parameters that are observed and measured by approximations. So what we see is that upon the aspect of actually doing business management and organizational leadership, um, we see that critical evaluation is present. We're also seeing that critical evaluation is also present upon um, the idea of actually interacting with employees and also doing performance appraisals. Also within the UK, there was a, a job analysis and a critical evaluation that was actually done upon con uh, the area of consultant development. And this is within the area of actually performance management now. And the the grounded theory and the, the results indicated that the consultant reported that there were primary barriers during practice, and these barriers were time constraints, excessive workload, lack of skills, lack of self-efficacy to undertake the research, poor research culture, and a lack of support. They also revealed um, that there were main compulsory factors such as dedicated time, research training, skills development, mutually beneficial alliances, as well as enhanced managerial understanding of the consultant and research um, idea and construct. So what we find here is that critical evaluation is very important to each area in each one of these sectors, um, whether it be um, at the top of the, the chain of organizational leadership and then also directly um, consulting and working with your employees. So now upon the subject of communication, we also found the definition um, by SHRM, and that um, explains um, in depth what that definition is. So a study based out of Ecuador um, have studied the nature of leadership, voice behavior, and also employee moral efficacy. So we're showing that there is a trend that research is, is taking place upon this subject. And what we're gonna see is that research is actually being taking place almost everywhere upon the concept of communication. So within um, Singapore, we show that um, throughout the communications process, people require information. They also explain within this study that communication is like a lifeline of projects because it provides a linkage between management, client, and project team members, as well as other stakeholders. We also find um, studies um, based out of uh, France that conducted a unique evaluation to better understand the challenges and opportunities of using humor-based communication style, as sometimes the type of communication um, can kind of be used within this area as well, or a kind of help. So what we're showing is that in the recruitment and advertising sector, while you're recruiting for a job position, um, they're finding that um, research specified humor as an effective strategy that provides managers a new understanding of humor um, as a marketing device in recruitment and advertising campaigns for employees. And then also based out of the U.S. in 2016, um, Johnson, Lu, Lu Kozowski, as well as Stone, they also have they also have um, human resource management systems playing upon the subject of, of social media and technology. Um, it's showing that it also has an influence in organizational functioning, functioning, and communication. It also, um, according to an office team illustration. Um, it says that more employees than senior managers think that it's okay to connect with colleagues on social networking sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. So this is important because as this study is for social media and human resources, we see that um, studies across the world are now showing that it, there is a correlation or a connection between posting, but now we're showing that it, it is in the manner in, in which you post also. There's, there's different aspects to it. So a study based out of Trinidad and Tobago also conducted an evaluation of the adoption of integrated human resource information systems. 
and it showed that um, it provided insights into the innovations of developing countries that are implementing e-government in public organizations. Um, it says the major findings indicated that there was a complex interaction of technological, organizational, and environmental factors of which interacted, uh, which is now showing also that technology to be very important um, as it does add to the daily function of the actual job within places um, across the globe. Researcher Lalanda of uh, the United States in 2011 also believes that an understanding of how communication technology challenges impact the success of teams within social media organ and organizations can reference best practices and develop processes and define policies to follow. So to this, researchers suggest that successful team implementation requires a combination of leveraging best practices uh, specific to business and effective technological processes. So again, in the United States, um, Cordon Marshall in 2015, they conducted an additional study upon the hype and reality of social media use for work collaboration and team communication. Results show that traditional communication channels are used more frequently and considered more effective for team communication. In addition, the Cordon and Marshall results, they designate that the Generation X and Generation Y business professionals are quite likely to consider social networking tools um, to be like the primary tools for team communication in the future. So now there's a study based out of um, the Arabic countries as well that emphasizes that it's also important to acknowledge this reality and support of um, effective organizational communication and also relationship management strategies. So now upon the subject of relationship management. We're seeing that Sherm also outlines this and defines the concept. And within the, U the UK, Wally and Wright in 2016, they describe relationship management as a function to improve effectiveness, quality of service, and also internal team structure. Also within the, uh, the Arabic countries, it also states that they are researchers, Kwarishi, Raza, and Witty. Uh, in 2015 argue that the implementation of communication based technological opportunities have improved the relationships between leaders and clients. Based out of Italy and um, also based out of France and other countries as well, researchers also reported the views upon marketing strategy um, and they use this within Starbucks and also the Tivana Corporation as the researcher mentions that the business relationship management strategy should include information sharing, emotion invoking and action inducing content. So what we see is that what we're pulling out of that study based out of humor um, and also based out of the manner in which we communicate, we can also uh, triangulate this based back into leadership strategy and how you communicate with um, your employees or even those that you're trying to get involved with and it, it, mash, it, it meshes into the area of marketing and it was further recommended that brands should use various types of content as we just explained and focus on visual content and also prepare for and manage customer interactions appropriately to be successful on social media platforms. So a study out of Peru, it sought to determine if teamwork is also related to adaptation and changing work environments among workers of the ADECO staffing agency. So the researchers used both qualitative and quantitative interests that involved in-depth interviews and structured questionnaire. And the research results revealed that ADECO Peru evaluated the teamwork as positively related to the adaptation to changing work environments. So as we could see, um, communication is very important within the area of also change management. So the University of California, Santa Cruz indicates that the client and employee relationship and, and relationship management to comprise of four themes and also involve an understanding of what the individual is asking for and needs, which is very important. And also executing or delivering what the individual is requesting and predicting what the individual will need in the future. So by delivering targeted communications to respond to these individual needs, the communication is kind of, um, uh, being transferable also within this right because it is also working um, as an agent to relationship management. 
in managing relationships. Also, a study out of China also says that recent studies suggest that managing conflict and trust can also reinforce each other to support diversity and synergy um, within the area of managing relationships internationally. Also, researchers of the United Kingdom identify the stakeholder relationship ma ma management maturity approach as a method that assists organization in the act of successfully implementing um, a stakeholder mindset or culture developed through a process of reflection, action research, and continuous improvement. So what we're also seeing is that studies also indicate that Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory also focusing focuses upon um, relationship management and pulling from the needs of your clients as well as your um, stakeholders. Um, as it focuses on internal or intrinsic drivers of behavior that require leaders to understand and identify their workplace. So these five basic needs, as we know, consist of physiological needs, safety and security, belonging and love, esteem and self-actualization. So in a professional right, it's just a matter of uh, figuring out how you can incorporate that within your company. So what we're seeing is that across um, several different other countries as well, um, they explain that um, an increased understanding of these factors upon member motivation can not only contribute to relationship management initiatives, but also towards global and cultural effectiveness. And this is by scholars Shin, Sharma, um, Ediger, uh, Shapiro, and Farah in 2011. So now upon the concept of global and cultural effectiveness, we see that our presidential administration is kind of working upon that as Vice President Mike Pence has indicated that commerce and cultural competency as central to both the economic prosperity and well-being of international partners. Also, SHRM defines the um, definition of global and cultural effectiveness. And moving into the studies, we see that within the UK, um, Garavan, McCarthy, and Morley, they are becoming, they say that scholars are becoming increasingly aware of gaps in knowledge of the basic elemental building blocks of human resource development in many territories that were on a significant developmental trajectory and cultural tenets. We're also seeing that researchers Rakim Pesakovic introduced the notion that globalization has changed the competitive field on which countries and companies view national and international markets. So we're seeing that um, globalization and global markets are, are very important. And we're seeing also that um, countries within, within all um, aspects of business are looking at global and cultural effectiveness, or they're actually transferably using this. Um, Jackson and Michie of 2017, they did an evaluation upon Gulf Arab leadership style and it, how it impacts the state of human resource management. And what they said was that researchers suggested that to be effective, human resource leadership um, policies and practices need to be crafted and implemented to work in alignment with the business's culture. And as we know, within an international business, it should be aligned with global and cultural effectiveness in international cultures. So uh, Gert Hofstein, his dimensions of culture seek to analyze the nature of global culture and understanding. And within the United States, there was a study that was conducted upon the engagement in influential cultural events and the development of cultural competence. Um, and this is done by Richard, Sierra, Condren, Wilder, Dolowit, and Wang in 2015. And the researchers explain building upon the assumption that international experiences influence growth in employees' cultural, um, cross-cultural competency. So in further example, they conducted an analysis and it was of 85 um, United States-based undergraduate students that were working and both studying abroad. And they wanted to study cultural experiences and they encount that were encountered during international living actually. And the study concluded that of these two studies collectively present in innovative and viable supplement to international emergent experiences for the development of international intelligence. And they provided a useful tool for organizations in a rapidly changing glowing, grow, glowing or growing global marketplace. All right, so now upon business acumen. Now, what we're seeing is that within the United States, um, researchers proclaim that as the interest of international economy, it grows um, 
it continues to grow for business. And it's important that leaders apply a global mindset and business acumen competency to operate effectively, as you must know um, how what type of, of tasks are involved with um, a global business, of course. And this could be upon an, an area of policy or what have you. Um, also, studies within France um, also indicate in 2016 by Casimov, um, in the global knowledge economy, organizational employees pay, play significant roles in the firm's competences due to their personal competencies and the human capital that they constitute for modern organizations. So this can be based upon like an international employee type basis as a um, hiring employees that are from different countries and the type of knowledge that they bring to the organization. Also, a study based out of South Africa also in, in includes that um, business knowledge and business intelligence within business acumen is very important because it's critical um, practice to also adapt, adopt and also invest in, not just for the company, but also for those that are working there. Robertson and Aquino, 2016, they believe that the emergence of technological advancements also influenced the need for skilled personnel as well. And in 2016, Trujillo and Cole suggested that this is because knowledge has evolved around technological factors that many learners have become very comfortable with, thus also explaining um, the correlation between or the connection between social media and its importance within business acumen now as well and social networking. Also, Aquino, Robertson, Allen, and, and Witte of 2017, they believe that the workforce market competition emboldens organizations and its stakeholders to form competencies that increase marketability through educational development. So now we're tying this um, need for social media and, uh, as well as the need for knowledge of social media also with the concept of business acumen in knowing your job. So a study based out of the Vietnam in 2015, um, there was a questionnaire that was administered to 120 women business owners in several collectives um, within the Quan Tri province. And the findings suggested that business training can improve micro enterprise performances and has many other positive results such as increasing motivation, success, and the perception of entrepreneurs as the study was upon um, women Vietnam entrepreneurs in 2015. Um, a study based out of the United States um, from Litano and Major suggests that organizations should be focused upon the whole life approach to administering career development when um, considering um, this within the area of business acumen. Also, a study out of, of China also described the business acumen function to be, of course, analytical, quantitative, and empirical in nature when um, considering the development of training in this area. Also in the U.S., the U.S. Signa and Warbach 2017 described organizational management to consist of communication, decision making, op operations, as well as leadership competencies, thus tying all of literally all of the concepts of the Schoenbach competencies together. And they say that scholars believe that business acumen function is very strategic and it even expands beyond the scope of these elements. And as you can see, the business acumen function kind of, it, it kind of uh, stems off and kind of branches into these other subjects that we are mentioning within the study. So there was another study based out of Lebanon that, um, there, that was based on architectural leadership. And, and as a neglected core of organizational leadership, the researcher further defined the term as a leadership ability to structure an organization in service to its strategy to improve its capability and enhance its value. So what we're seeing is a tie between leadership and navigation, as well as a little bit of critical evaluation within the business acumen of doing your job. And what it's saying is upon all right, so also upon the concept of consultation, what we see is that the leaders of SHRM are defining the concept within the review of literature, the theoretical framework. What we also see is that leaders across the globe also imply that human resource management practices have decisive influence upon organizational change outcomes, as we know that consultation is very important to the area of organizational change, as that is the recommendation side of it. Also, um, researchers of the United Kingdom also suggest that the strength of the change resistance is affected by the leadership competency and communicative based change management role of HR. So what we're seeing is that these concepts are now kind of triangulating with one another.
Also, Anderson in 2016 said that skilled in organizational development of practitioners understand the dynamics of human systems and can intervene to encourage a healthy and engaging and productive environment, thus stating um, the importance of consultation. And also within the UK, again, researchers suggest that organizations need to think carefully about the role of HR during organizational change, and they also need to encourage HR to adopt a strategic uh, change agent role. Also within the US, researchers discuss strategies to foster a consultative engagement to produce transparency, clarified expectations, accountability support, avoiding barter, and analyzing rewards and responsibilities. So John Carter also developed the eight-step change model out of the United States that um, kind of created these steps that would include the need for creating urgency, forming a powerful alliance, creating a vision for change, removing obstacles, creating short-term wins, building on the change, and then incorporating the changes within the structure, and then also communicating the vision, thus showing everything um, very important within the area and how all of these um, terms technically kind of correlate and connect with one another and can even a actually um, be actually this one and the same when practicing one another. So these are our established research questions. So this project's goal is designed to provide scholarly knowledge regarding the significance of international human resource training presented within social science classes. This qualitative study multiple perspectives pertaining to the presence of human resource leadership and the many of the life. Considering this, the literary research goal will be achieved through theoretical evaluation of scholarly and peer-reviewed publications as well as the confirmed by your colleagues and colleagues. In addition, the intent of this research project is also to suggest that the nature of these theoretical tests can shape an understanding of the field of from this demographic, I hope to generate data based upon the following research questions. Which geographical locations are present within the human resource-based social media platform? And which geographical locations present the most participation within the human resource-based social media platform? Research question two indicates which industries and trades do the social media platform guests reflect or most represent? And research question three, out of a list of leadership and navigation, ethical practice, critical evaluation, business acumen, relationship management, communication, consultation, and global and cultural effectiveness-based training and development themes. Which of these do social media platform guests most prefer? The researcher seeks to gather information from the popular social media network known as LinkedIn. With over 500 million users, statistics report that 70% of LinkedIn users are from the outside Demographic data mentions that of all users on LinkedIn, after the United States, like India, Brazil, Great Britain, and Canada, has a representation of the highest number of individuals. Upon the basis of recruitment, LinkedIn now has 40 million active job seekers on the platform and daily reports of more than 1 million professionals that are engaged in or currently on LinkedIn. According to career sources in the Bay, nearly three out of four companies staffing companies will not find qualified employees. In addition, there are currently about 20,000 offices placing temporary workers nationwide and 18 to 20 percent of the temporary workers find permanent work through their assignments. Considering international staffing and social media, collectively, researchers and recruiters of the following locations and organizations explain the need for social media through the concept of digitization communication, job recruitment, leadership capabilities, and governance. This theoretical framework encapsulates the significance of human resource subject matter within international social media platforms. The foundations of theoretical investigation will include a review of relevant literature regarding human resource from this review of literature, the reader should develop an enhanced awareness of the state of human resource training and training. 
This research design of the study was to evaluate the association between social media platforms in addition to the themes regarding human resources for their development through qualitative analysis. So now let's get comfortable and talk about the survey results in a little bit of detail. So what you're seeing right now is a PowerPoint presentation that's going to provide you with a listing of every research question as well as each result based upon that question. What we find upon the first page of the presentation is a listing of all of the locations that um, represented the most participation within this international human resource based platform survey. So what this is going to do is tabulate the information based upon those that participated in the survey, not necessarily those that participated within all of LinkedIn. And all of these respondents were gathered based upon um, the researchers actual profile as well as their LinkedIn or extending LinkedIn network. So all of those within the LinkedIn network or of those within the LinkedIn network, this is a listing of all countries of all those that participated within the LinkedIn network, these are a listing of all of those that um, participated. The survey results also presented that the research participant sample presented the following industries and trades. And this is a listing of all of the industries and trades and of those that participated within the study from each and every single country um, that came in. Upon a geographical viewpoint, the time zone of the participating locations could have affected the data um, as the average um, day that I participated in all of these and put out the surveys was on Monday, January 15th, and I started them at 5 p.m. So what we're going to find is um, there may have been a limitation in the research results as we're going to see the disparity or the difference between the time zones in each country and location and the timing that those posts for the survey were presented. This is a continuing slide of some of the times and the time zones and the areas of which um, the respondents came from and also responded. And this last slide also represents the same. All right, so additionally, um, the reason why I did this also is because these results report the nature of what we like to call social media content lifespans. Um, an example, like uh, social media marketing expert Re Rebecca Coleman, she reports an average content lifespan of a Twitter-based feed to be around 15 minutes. So let's travel on to that of, of LinkedIn. And they reported that the um, average lifespan of a LinkedIn post would be a lifespan of 24 hours. So as we see, based upon the time frames of the average lifespan of the post and then also the average lifespan or the time frame of when that post was posted or responded to, we see that there could be a little bit of research limitation as to those that could have gathered the, inform uh, the information. If I could do it all over again, what I would do is probably um, post within a time frame that would be relative to that of the US-based time frame. Uh, for example, do the calculations and the math based upon it actually being 5 p.m. within um, that other country as well as another country, of which would allow for me to probably <laughs> stay up and, uh, for 24 hours and not catch any sleep. But um, if I were to do it all over again, that would be my recommendation for research um, to gather better information and also to, also to catch respondents at better time frames.
right, so let's get into some of the table data that we found within the research and some of our findings. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at some of this data as you're looking at it so I can better um, give you a review of exactly what you're seeing and the results that I am providing. So while doing this, what you're going to see is that there's a total research population table that is going to represent exactly what you saw on that first slide um, regarding all of the research participants that came in. Now what it's going to show you is the number of participants that came in from those specific countries. Within the research study, there's also a written out table of exactly the number of research participants. Also, what I did within figure one was I gave an overview of, at the time, that total LinkedIn network population that I had um, was 7,743 research participants. And of those uh, 7,743, um, I'm sorry, LinkedIn network um, population, I only had 75 participants that consented to the respondents. So I had 100, I think over 100 respondents, but um, some of those I kind of had to take out just because of the fact that they did not consent to the research, but 75 of them consented and it was valid um, research documentation. If I had to do it all over again, I would definitely extend out the timing um, for the number of research participants that I could take in. Um, also, for the nature of the uh, survey uh, tool that I was using, I would probably want to use more so of a survey tool that would probably represent SPSS or um, some other format, just because of the fact that if I were to extend and maybe have a um, goal of 7,000 um, participants, then I probably would want to collect a, a collection of more data, and probably I would change it into a qual uh, at that time I'd change it into a quantitative study, but. As this is a qualitative study, I went ahead and took it from those 75 participants. So what you're going to see now is after I've taken out the 75% um, or after I've taken out from those 75 um, of those that participated, now we have a 100% consent rate. Also, what I did was I created a figure that was going to give an illustration um, upon a world map of where um, I got my research participation from. As you see, there are still countries within continents that have been unaccounted for. And if I were to continue this research, as I do see that I have an extended amount of time after the study is over to continue it, I may want to kind of expand out and see if I can gather more data from the countries that have been unaccounted for. Within the table two, what you're gonna see is also a layout again of those countries of those part that participated and the number of those that participated within the study. And what you're gonna see is those that participated and also a number of those that participated within the study. Also what you're gonna see in figure four is an illustration of data displaying a representation of the survey populations, industries, and trades. So upon that document that you saw or upon that slide that you saw with just the general um, written titles of those. Now what you're going to see is that based upon a pie chart of where those industries um, came from and then also those that participated the most. What you're also going to see in figure five is a pie chart of um, that represented the illustration of data displaying the representation of career titles upon um, the survey population as well. So it's going to be based upon the industry, the first one, and then this one now that we're viewing is based upon survey population and is in based upon career title as well. All right, so now getting into the um, research questions out of a list of human resource training and development themes, which themes do social media platform devs mostly prefer? I did a breakdown of each theme based upon those listed themes, um, based upon the Sherm bot competency model. And upon the first one, what we saw was that um, upon business acumen, of a number of 75 responses, we found that there were mixed reviews upon um, the business acumen competency. What I did prior to even presenting some of these themes, just to make sure that they had an understanding of the themes too, was that there was a, a presentation that embodied the definition of those themes. So that way they could have a better understanding as they were participating in the study and answering questions based, based upon these descriptions of themes. 
So again, under business acumen, what you're going to see is that 25 out of 75 of those responses kind of said that they would, they gave it like a, out of one out of five, they gave like a number four rating of how, that it was almost, almost important how, but it wasn't the most important. Also, ringing in behind that was some voted that it was most important. And then also they had like mixed reviews. So what I'm seeing is that there were mixed reviews, but ultimately it is something that's important, but they don't really see business acumen is that important. So within this research study, what I would find is that business acumen is actually the actual doing of the job. This is, this is you reporting that you can actually do the job. And these are the actual job descriptions and the tasks of someone doing the job. And I just thought that it was a little ironic that it, it was important, but not, not that important to my respondent. So one of the things I probably will want to ask in a subsequent study is why. So the next important one was communication. So what I saw is out of the 75, they wanted to rate their preference of communication as a competency for workplace organization or their societal view. And they said communication was most important. And that was um, of those 35 out of the 75. So most of them rated it at most important. I um, would probably take this into account being that we are studying international um international human resources of which accounts for people all across several different countries of which means that we are all speaking several different languages. So I could understand the, the reasoning and the logic behind why they, they accounted this as most important. The next question would be their preference of consultation and that competency within the workplace organization or societal view. Consultation would be the act of doing consulting or the act of kind of giving someone advice or, con or consult consulting. So within this area, what I saw is that 25, which the most out of 75, presented that it was kind of important, not, not important, but almost important. So they gave it a, a four out of five rating and they explained that this competency was was at a four out of five rating. Now, what I would want to do in a sub subsequent study was would probably be to ask why this is so. Um, why getting advice isn't as important um, and also why business acumen wouldn't be as important as that as communication. Within figure nine, what we're seeing is that um, a question based upon critical evaluation and its importance. So what we saw was kind of something significant here because out of a response of 75, we got 25 that which was the most that marked it as important. But then there was a, a one point difference with those that voted 20 that only had 24 votes of it being at a number four out of five rating. So what I would probably want to do in a in a subsequent study would be to ask um, the, why this difference is so, and also why critical evaluation would it be as important as communication. So what we're seeing now is that communication is most important out of actually doing the job, out of actually evaluating concepts and themes, and then also why communication is more important than consulting. So that's, that's, um, that's an interesting concept, and I probably would want to, within a subsequent study or research survey, um, probably not necessarily go into survey research, but probably speak to them um, myself or probably within uh, a context of an email or something in written uh, form of edu uh, written form of communication. But whatever form of communication, I communicate with them and literally ask them why um, these, these disparities are so. So this is figure 10A, which is the ethical practice competency of which is practicing ethics. Now, within the first response of 10A, we had everyone that um, explained that ethical practice was very important. So ethical practice and, um, and also communication was very important. Um, in addition to that, and that was 31 out of 75 respondents that voted it out of a one out of five. And then also in 10B, 
um, it looked like there was a an equal kind of representation of that because in 10B out of 74, 27 voted it to be kind of important um, with a four out of five rating. And then five, um, uh, 27 out of um, the 74 kind of voted it to have a, um, voted it to have like a five out of, oh, out of one out of five rating. So what I would wanna do is what I saw was I just kind of wanted to test the validity of the results. And what I found was that information that we kind of looked at was that sometimes people can think um, in a certain way in one moment and then the next moment they'll think in another way. So what I would wanna do in a subsequent study is probably to ask why. That's one of the things that I'm missing within the survey is, is why they, they answered in the manner that they answered the research in. Going into figure 11, which is my favorite subject of global and cultural effectiveness, um, they are showing that out of the um, 75 number of respondents, there were 26 that accounted for it being of the most important. So they got uh, 26 of them voted it at a, a five out of a one out of five rating scale. Um, and then 23 kind of came in at it being uh, most of, uh, not that important. So what we're seeing now is that communication, um, ethical practice kind of had that that um, disparity a little bit. And so what we're seeing is that um, within communication, we're seeing that that was most important. Ethical practice was also important. And then global and cultural effectiveness is also showing as most important within that, that um, top five rating. What I'm showing is that why communication was most important, global and cultural effectiveness was important, and then also ethical practice was also important. I would take those themes, and then I would also take the ones that they were, that were kind of voted as important but not so important, and I would ask why they were answering these questions as such. Um, once I would figure that out, then I would also add um, kind of more information revolving why they answered in this way. So I feel like within this study, we gathered and we figured out the themes, we figured out where where they are within the world and what people all over the world feel in regard to international um, human resource recruitment and things of that sort. So we know that they want, they want a global state. We know that they want understanding. We know that they want good communication. And we also know that they want like good ethical practice. But we're, what I wanna know, what I want to know more of is why um, business acumen and actually doing the job itself and doing it right is not as important as the other themes. I also want to know why giving guidance is not as important as all of the other things as um, being within that type of a field um, probably isn't guidance based. Um, but I probably want to ask that why why consultation isn't important as um, within a, a job interview you kind of get that consultation type feel. Um, also, what I would like to know is why critical evaluation isn't important because um, within that field I would I would probably I I want to know why critical evaluation isn't important because in order to review a resume or do job evaluation or job description, um, you would have to critically review information. It just seems like um, the actual technical theme of, of doing the job itself um, is less important than, than just the behavioral or general nature of global effectiveness. So that kind of puts me in a realm to not say that the study was in, inconclusive because we have definitely enough knowledge to know where they stand and where everyone from the world is, um, who answered the research, and then also um, where they stand in regard to these human resource themes of which was exactly what we wanted to accomplish out of this study. But now what I would like to really know is just is why. And I'm still stuck on that. And I would hope that I can, within a subsequent study, um, answer the why as to why they answered in the manner that they did within the study. Um, and then also I would like to gather more information and kind of um, get that, that whole general overview of the entire world um, where we didn't account for within the study as well. 
kind of a link to human resource training and development, the survey respondents indicated that they mentioned ethical practices and even interpreted IT as the most preferred human resource training and development method, as displayed within Figure 3A of the survey. The survey respondents reacted differently when I posed two ethical um, questions offered the interpreter three different questions for credibility. The prime service group results indicate a psychological and cognitive resilience that presents within the nature of human resource research. According to Dr. Arlene R. Kimball, no two brains are the same or will need to be identical in structure, function, or perception. The prime individual cognition. Dr. Taylor explains the possibility that it is so is that individuals are physically capable of thought, exhibit the same behavior, learn identical information, and relate or interpret information in the same manner at any given time. This notion could also be supported under the concept of cognitive theory, which states that human responses are governed by emotions, of which the child human logic or cognitive ability. So let's review over our results. Chapter 1 summarizes the international staffing and review trends that drive the international recruiting industry. Chapter 1 also suggests social media as a possible counterpart to the growing social media. The theoretical framework encapsulated the significance of human resource subject matter within international social media trends. The foundations of theoretical investigation included a review of relevant literature regarding human resource trends and trainings. This review of literature provided scholarly and professional vendor preferences regarding the human resource characteristics as mentioned in navigation, ethical practice, relationship management, communication, global and cultural effectiveness, business acumen, consultation, and critical evaluation. The methodology in its entirety presented an exploration of the existence of human resource recruitment, skills training, and professional development trends within the LinkedIn social media platform. The methodology involved an outline of the ethnographic research design, research subjects, instrumentation, methodological assumptions, limitations, and dependence, in addition to data processing and the research results section analyzed the international demographic capacity of current HR recruitment and development practices within an international social media web service program. Chapter 4 uncovered data regarding the study's research questions and the international demographic capacity of human resource recruitment and development in the social media platform or research recruitment industry known as LinkedIn. This study in its entirety offered multiple perspectives pertaining to the presence of human resource leadership. This study in its entirety offered multiple perspectives pertaining to the presence of human resource leadership, academic perspectives, and the vendors that provide them. The review of literature focused upon the nature of international business industry research and popular trends that promote social media based recruitment, skills training, and professional development. This study has discovered that the basis for recruitment and development based trends are now specifically known concerning global recruitment, skills training, and professional development preferences and dependence. This study contributed to the current body of literature upon the subject of technology, global talent acquisition, and training. Thank you so much for participating in this presentation regarding human resource training and professional development preferences. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me within the area of perfectindifferentconsulting.com. Thank you for your participation within this course of course regarding human resource thinking, professional training, and professional development. In summary, this dissertation identified the research problem as a lack of investigation upon the nature of recruitment, human resource skills training, and professional development initiatives within international social media platforms. 
this chapter includes a discussion of the findings, overall conclusions, implications for professional practice, and recommendations for further research. In summary, the study seeks to add to the body of knowledge within the field of human resource leadership studies. Therefore, the study within its entirety embarks on a comprehensive review of the existence of human resource improvement, skills training, and professional development plans within the social field of medicine. This project serves as a low risk to the harming of human subjects due to the fact that it is not interactional. It does not require interviews. It's solely based upon computer-based observatory. From this project, participants benefit because they have the ability to receive limited free resources to skills training, professional development, and recruitment. Academically, this research serves to add to the body of knowledge within the field of social media-based recruitment, skills training, and professional development in human resource management. So if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer um, any of your questions regarding the, um, this, this, this dissertation and the data that was revealed within this study. So now I would like to turn this over um, to the research panel or to those that would have any questions relevant to um, the developments found within this study.